So I'm going to try to spare you guys from reading bios from for each of you. I hope you don't mind uh, doing that, but hopefully we can, with the first question, we can help introduce you to the audience here. Um, and uh, I also want to say, like this, I've been very excited about this panel. Like, just is super. Uh, uh, when Eugene first mentioned it to me, I was just like, oh my god, finally, like we have everybody in the house who's really going to set the stage for the next 20 years, and. I mean, this is a little bit like not just to, and again, I see this in a positive light, uh, you know, but this is kind of like, and maybe a little bit of a negative light, this is kind of like getting Netflix, YouTube, and Warner Brothers together to like talk about <laughs> the future of filmmaking. And, uh, and it's so, there's so many opportunities and so many risks, uh, obviously, in this. Uh, but I'm also, I, I just want to point out, like, for us as designers, like, we do have a tendency to think of things as being, like, trends, like, oh, like, isn't it cool, this type of type right now? Like, isn't global type cool right now? You know, stuff like that. But, you know, this is not a trend. Like, this is a permanent change. Uh, and it's, in, and, and at the same time, there's a side of this permanent change, which is even pushing the global change, because you have these very large companies that are able to do the kind of work that is not able to be done at a small scale, and you have very large companies that can really dictate like what, what, what will happen uh, after, and that are not necessarily design companies too. So, um, but I, I, as as we go, I do want to just impress upon you like that you know we're not just kind of going on a on a line like this, like oh like here we are Dwiggins, and then we're going to do this, and the, you know it's this is this is a big shift uh, that we're talking about for the next uh, half hour or so. So. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Irene. So Irene is uh, 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 here from from Google, and I'm going to ask you actually to talk about like what you what you do there. Before then, though, I want to just uh, note that as of yesterday, Google served 29 trillion 104 billion 658 million 497 thousand 578 fonts or, or instances of hitting the type uh, from their servers. So uh, I in terms of scale, <laughs> uh, this is, this is a, the biggest shift and, and, a, and a huge thing. So, um, but can you tell us a little bit about like, what do you do there and how did you, what did you do before you got, like how did you get there and what do you do there? Yeah, uh, so I'm a visual designer um, on the Google Fonts team. And um, I am responsible for all the visual interaction um, aspect, design aspects for the Google Fonts products. And um, the projects that I've been working on include like UX UI updates for Google Fonts site and promotional, promotional websites, um, type design reviews, um, and, um, and all the visual designs for social media, um, specimens, and other um, like design that google.com uh, article collections. And, and why does Google do this? Why do they support Google Fonts? Why do Google? Yeah. So um, Google's um, mission the, um, is um, they want to organize the world's information um, and make it uni make it universally accessible and useful. Uh, so uh, that's company's mission. So um, and Google Fonts makes it possible to deliver the information globally. Great. And. Now I will move on to Dan Radigan. And Dan Radigan, uh, say it again. Say, correct me. <laughs> we'll say correct my, the, the pronunciation of my name. Yes. It's Dan Radigan. Dan Radigan. OK, I got it right. OK. The silent H Sorry. Throws, up, throws off every. Radigan. Um, Radigan. So uh, Dan, Dan is coming to us from uh, Adobe, Adobe Fonts, which is now Adobe Fonts. Uh, Oh, were you with them when it was Typekit, or no? I was. You were. Yeah. Okay, so maybe he can tell us a little bit about that. Uh, in terms of scale, so uh, I think we all know that Adobe uh, moved to a system of, of subscription some time ago. Type Typekit always had a subscription mode anyway. So, but there is the in terms of anybody who is setting type, especially for print, like you have a. Uh, sometimes uh, loving, sometimes not relationship with your software, which is from Adobe. Like there's like no, uh, uh, there's very little competition, um, little to no competition there. Uh, and so, and I wonder if I have, yeah. And, and I don't know if you can tell us a little bit about the scale of Adobe Fonts and Typekit, but also tell us a little bit about how did you get there? What's the history? 
Um, well, so I, I manage uh, the Adobe type development team, which has been, um, which is now part of the larger Adobe fonts team. Um, the type team at Adobe uh, has been there since the start of the company because John Warnock and Chuck Geschke realized that you know, if they were going to get any traction with their technology about page description and making documents, you needed typography. If you're going to communicate, you needed something to represent the text. So they've always supported um, development of like good typography in order to show off the sophistication of their software products. And that's kind of been a through line up to what my team does today. For a long time, um, the type team at Adobe was responsible for making their original typefaces so that there'd be fonts available for, for users of the software. Um, when Typekit was acquired by Adobe, um, all of the foundry partners that worked with Typekit sort of supplanted that need to provide like choice and options for users to work with. And the type teams began a shift that I've been trying to really lean into with them about being sort of an, an internal R&D unit to basically make very complex font projects that are constantly pushing the boundaries of what they can do. Essentially, we want to make beautiful, well-designed typefaces that also um, make sure that the rest of our products and the rest of sort of like font technology support can really do what it promises to do. So we kind of make life difficult for our colleagues. Um, <laughs> but that's part of this, um, and this, this shift from Typekit into becoming Adobe Fonts is indicative of Adobe realizing that the use of typography is this essential connective tissue to their product suite. Uh, if you're doing any kind of creative work, any kind of document work that has a verbal component, typography has to be a part of that. So that was this shift from Typekit from being like a standalone product to something that should just be an essential part of the experience of using all the Adobe products. And, and similarly, uh, if you could, well, actually, we should even back up all the way to maybe people who are not familiar with Typekit at all. Yeah. What was, why is Typekit important? Like, what was the important thing that they did? And then why would Adobe, which is a company that makes software for designers, why would they be, have been interested in in buying Typekit in the first place? Well, Typekit um, started out as a web font service. When uh, web font technology became possible, um, Typekit tried to like crack the problem of how do you, how do foundries get compensated for the use of their typefaces to be served as web fonts? Um, and that was an interesting business model. They made, they had developed good relationships with foundries um, whose fonts they were making available for the web. Um, and that was that was Adobe's interest. Like, ah, here's here's a service that has an interesting technology infrastructure that Adobe hadn't really like built itself yet. Um, as well as uh, these partnerships that would make more type available for their users. Um, so they acquired Typekit to kind of like really bring that to life. And in the after that acquisition Typekit led the way for this. It's not just about web fonts, but it's also about um, making fonts available for the desktop. Just sort of becoming like the channel for the users of the Adobe products to have type available for them to work with in a way that also um, was fair to the type boundaries. The service is about making sure that users get type um, with as little excuse to seek it out illegally as possible. Okay, and uh, now on to Charles. So uh, Charles Nix is uh, coming to us from Monotype today, and uh, Monotype is, I mean, probably the oldest roots of all time, you know, in, in terms of a type company, especially here in the US. Uh, so, uh, you know, this this discussion we had about IBM and Helvetica Noia, like the people that they didn't want to pay the licensing fees to was Monotype. It was me. It was it was Charles, uh, and and uh, so all of these uh, things that you get in your menu: uh, Helvetica, Avenir, Frutiger, Trade Gothic, Futura, Gil Sands, and my nemesis Baskerville are all licensed uh, by by uh, 
uh, Monotype. Um, they also, just again, I wanted to give a sense of scale. So Monotype posted $71.4 million in revenue last year. So if you're thinking about like scale of type company or distribution, like it's, it's not Google. Uh, but it's also in the if you're going to compare it to smaller uh, type collectives or foundries, like it is, it is the giant in that space. So, uh, so Char Charles, if you could tell us a little bit about where you know how did you end up in the chair that you sit in there? What do you do there? And also, and I'll, I'll ask my follow up question after that. All right. So, um, I ended up at Monotype. Three years, four, three and a half years ago, four years ago now, uh, it seems to have gone by really quickly. Um, I ended up there after twenty years in publishing and education. Um, I started when I was ten, so. Um, <laughs> the but so I come to it very much from a user side. Also, um, I've been designing type pretty much since I was in college, um, but then. Um, off and on professionally throughout that 20 year period uh, after college. So um, the, what I bring to type design at Monotype is that sort of, um, that sort of Janice head of somebody who's used type really intensively um, for, for a couple of decades and somebody who's designed type also. Um, what do I do there every day? I design type, which is kind of, a, I had those first three years, which were like sort of just pinch me years, and I'm in the fourth year of that where I still go to work every day designing type and think, this is, has to be some cruel joke. This must end at some point. <laughs> there must be some moment where somebody's going to say, now you just do taxes for the next three years. <laughs> um, it, it is as advertised. Um, uh, well, I started as a senior type designer, but now I'm a type director. Um, we do have a <laughs> very large and very old library by some calculations that dates from the 1500s. Um, and, you know, it contains classics. Um, uh, every typeface that you could think of for the, from the first 300 years of typography is in our library. Um, our chief goal now in the 21st century through, um, through our mosaic type platform is to make the licensing of typefaces a non-issue. And how does it work now? How does it work now? Yeah, what's like a traditional type license and how is it different from what Typekit does or what Google does? Um, a traditional type, well, there's no, ours are all the same. Um, that's, the, that's the big difference. Um, so if you license a typeface from Monotype through Mosaic, it's, you get everything. You get to use it. Do you want to use it on the web? Use it on the web. Do you want to use it in a book? Use it in a book. you want to use it in an e-publication? Fine. Um, the whole purpose of Mosaic is to make that process uh, easy. And are you still serving? But are you serving them from Monotype? Or am I like downloading and installing it on my machine? You personally, Juliet? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically. Yeah. I mean, we of course still have, a, we have enterprise licensing for companies and for uh, agencies and, and brands. Um, and then we do have consumer level products also. So it sort of, depending on who's using it, it's going to be a uh, slightly different answer. And, and, and I mean, uh, the reason why I'm asking you this is because like for people who are very, very new to, to this, uh, they're, the idea, for example, in my time, to go back to you, you, user, I guess, in my time, you would actually, I would actually go to like a store or like I would order something and then they would actually send me a CD in the mail or uh, I don't know, was there a floppy disk moment in this? Oh, and they then, were floppy uh, disks. They were floppy disks. <laughs> And then, and then I would put that into my machine, and then it, I owned the typeface. It was kind of like music, really, right? You know. And then there was like a long contract thing that I didn't read that came with the thing, and and you know, we and we operated like and that, this and for. And that contract said you didn't own it; you were uh, only uh, licensing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but but there was a tangible element to it. 
Um, and, and now I think it's, you know, it's obviously just in terms of conceptual models, like very, uh, very difficult for people to understand. But I do think it's important for, for this particular conversation to just understand what are these differences. I think you're, you're right. And I want to go back to what, what Anne said when she talked to me about the Wallbaum project. Keep in mind, I have to explain this to grandmas. <laughs> like, my mom needs to understand how this works. Um, and so uh, it's easy for me to say, well, you know, uh, subscribe to Mosaic and all your licensing problems will be solved. But let's talk about the license first. <laughs> I like that tack. I think it makes a lot of sense. So um, like Dan said, if you bothered to read the EULA for any typeface that you've bought throughout the history of your design career or your nascent career, um, you would know that you do not own that typeface. You own the right to use it and your license to use it in whatever way is spelled out in that end user license agreement. Um, so, uh, so here's a good time to ask Irene, what about Google? When I download a font, w what's going on? Do I own it? Uh, I would say yes. <laughs> um, How so, so? What's open source? Yeah, so I think I can talk about the, um, the licenses uh, from Google. Mm -hmm. So um, the fonts, uh, fonts licensing at Google hasn't changed in the last five years. Uh, so, so, so Google uses a variety of fonts under a full spectrum of licenses, uh, from the still open font license to Google-owned brand fonts, um, to, license, to licensed retail fonts like Comic Sans or Proxima Nova, um, with no changes recently. Mm, uh, so the, the still open font license allows users to um, to use, um, study, and copy, merge, like embed, modify, redistribute fonts uh, under uh, certain co conditions uh, that are listed in the SIL um, open font uh, license website in the long Q&A. Um, and all the Google fonts, um, all the fonts in the Google fonts product are under the SIL open font license. So for users, um, they can always like um, share in a start project with the fonts as they want uh, with their friends and colleagues. And um, to talk about the Libra license, mm. so um, the free the, uh, the the software free user user freedom movement started in the early 1980s. Um, talking about the free softwares like free elections, but the word is really ambiguous. Um, <laughs> what does that mean, free? Yeah, um, but, um, but other languages do have two words for the two different concepts, like gratis and Libra in Spanish and French. Mm -hmm. um, to disambiguate the licenses that respect each user's freedom, um, some people use, uh, some people like call them like uh, open source and others call them Libra. And, and uh, what was it that even I mean, like, why would Google want need that versus just licensing a font from Monotype, for example? Like, why why is a Libra license important for Google's other products? Because um, Google's Google, like as yeah. I said before, <laughs> Google's mission is to like organize the information, and when uh, when a license. When people have the the, the open front fonts under the seal open front license, mm -hmm. um, they can use the fonts anywhere any uh, anywhere they want to use in any language, yeah. and um, that makes really possible to deliver information um, really easily. I think all all of our companies we're approaching it at different models, but we're we're trying to do a similar thing of open up the, the field of possibilities for people mi making things or writing things to be able to choose typefaces. And there's different ways of trying to like remove the barriers to that and let people concentrate on what they want to make and not get like lost in this like landscape yeah. of figuring out, can I do like, this, can, can I, I do that? Can I buy this or yeah. use this on my computer? And actually, uh, uh, this is where we come back to you, Dan. Yeah. What is possible right now that wasn't possible ten years ago? Like, what is it that? Why would it? Like, why doesn't down? You know, purchasing a typeface that I purchased ten years ago. What What does that thing not do that I can do now? 
uh, I know this is a big question, and you know a lot about it, so see if you can answer that in like 10 seconds or less. But In, in yeah. terms of like... <laughs> Our business model, or the no, no, like just to go back to well, so we're back to back to me now, right? Uh, as the user, what is it that I can do with these new uh, typefaces, especially like if I'm using them on the web? Like, what is it that I can do with them that I just couldn't do when I was just downloading a bunch of characters? Like in a in a, I mean, you you call at some point, you say a typeface is a database, you know? Like what? Yeah. What do you mean by that? And like, what what can what are the possibilities we haven't been thinking about? We've touched on a couple of them today. Yeah. Well, in, I mean, in terms of the technology, where say like a typeface is a database that holds pictures of letters and information about how they interact. Um, so on the technological front, you know, we're doing things like color fonts and variable fonts. So adding additional capabilities, like different kinds of information, you can put into that database, but. I think particularly with things like trying to make more robust services for web font delivery, make it easier for people to um, have sort of a trusted source to get typefaces from, like, where did you buy those CDs from? Like, was it like a thousand fonts for a quarter that you like got on eBay? Um, <laughs> you know, we're trying to say like, we're accepting the, the burden for the quality of all those fonts and you just, you make your stuff. If you want to publish something on the web, use as many typefaces as you want. We'll try to optimize that experience, you know, give, give you fonts that, that you can work with. And I think it's really, I think particularly in the space of the web, it's really, really important to like bring robust typography to that medium because it's, it's supplanted a lot of other media that we communicated through. Um, and live text, um, is incredibly important. That's the big thing about the web. It, it, it's text that is accessible and scalable and copyable and editable. Um, and to get that functionality and make it look pretty and convey emotion through the use of typography, um, that's really, really, really powerful. And you know, that's like Google wanting people to work with information instead of pictures of information is a big thing for that. And for Adobe, we want the the making process and the creative process to be as like flexible as as possible. So type is really really important to us for that. And Google does a lot too. I, I read about like taking existing uh, typefaces and then improving them to the to like to some of the things that that Dan is saying here. What what I mean, any of you guys can answer this one too. Like what is what does that mean? Like a really quality typeface. I mean, does it mean like it has beautiful shapes? Like what? What's the difference between a quality typeface that a million people can use or seventy-five billion people can use uh, versus one that is not? Like what's what happens from that form being thrown into that system until I'm using, I'm downloading it and using it? What is that difference? So um, for our collections, we keep expanding our library for more families, more scripts, and more styles and weights. Um, um, and then we also constantly improving the quality of the existing fonts to help users to the better typography. Um, so um, that's what we've been doing for the um, the fonts that are in um, that are in the font Google Fonts products. Um, and but does somebody come and sprinkle magic holy water over it? Like what do they do? So. <laughs> So we work with a lot of like um, uh, independent like type boundaries and type designers, um, and um, they they work on the um, the existing fonts files on GitHub on the um the our Google Fonts GitHub website, um, and then they keep like improving with the um the fonts based on the um, the current open type uh, spec specification. I think mean, I mean, Google. There were a lot of people who were skeptical about Google Fonts when it started. Like, oh, is this like explosion of like free fonts? And a lot of our commercial businesses prop themselves up and they're just like, oh, don't use free fonts. Like, that's not good. I'm super <laughs> impressed with what Google has really committed to over the last few years about improving the quality of everything and making for a great experience for and, people. And part of that has been this explosion of, uh, you know, we, like the presentation that Rune gave earlier today uh, about Korean fonts, about other large set typefaces. Why, like, why, why is that happening? Like, what is, what is the, 
uh, uh, and how is that different from what happened before? Yeah, so our users are all around the world, and um, the fonts, um, the fonts make it possible to like deliver the information globally. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Google really thinks about the fonts um, as as an important part of their company, um, and for the international fonts. Um, uh, we see uh, fonts beyond Latin is really important for us, um, because um, our because our users are all around the world, and then we see um, CJK um, projects is really important for us because um, uh, the the Chinese, Ch Japanese, and Korean fonts on the web is um, are, are very little. And because of the, because these scripts are have a lot of like character sets, mm -hmm. and um, like how many? Like, like give us a scale. <laughs> so it's about like ten thousands. So having ten thousands of letters make it um, really difficult to dif difficult like make it make it fonts to like hard to draw and hard to serve. And we want to do our part to make that easier. And so I mean, Google, it, it's sort of like the right trifecta of people to talk about this because Google commissioned Monotype to like do one chunk of Unicode and Adobe type to do the other chunk of Unicode. So like the 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 Noto CJK fonts uh, we distribute as the source Han fonts. My team built those fonts. Um, and they came to us because like our experience in like pushing the boundaries of the spec, the 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 the, no, the the source Han fonts, the Noto CJK fonts, um, maximize the allowable number of characters that you can have in an open type font. Yeah. It's like in the realm of 65,000. And we're constantly figuring out, like, like finding all the duplication so that we can get extra characters and it, in it there. It takes an army to make a typeface like that. And, and right. it's so obviously yeah. three companies, too. Right. <laughs> so we have a studio at Monotype. Of of design, a design production production studio <clears throat> that is sixty plus people, with like a thousand years of experience collectively in type design. They're all so five hundred years old. <laughs> 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 well, it's average like you know fifteen to twenty years of experience per person. I mean, I'm I'm a junior <laughs> member. Um, so yeah, it's that kind of like it's that kind of design plus production experience, like Dan was saying, that allows. Uh, allows a project like the Noto project to sort of walk across our transom. Um, and so in the, in the time we have left, though, I, do, I also want to uh, highlight a few of the risks, starting with Noto. Like, I have a recent client project for uh, a, a company wants, that wants to do co-ops. And in the end, we landed on Noto because they wanted to distribute in 170 companies. I have a very strong feeling I'm going to be working with a lot more clients who are thinking about that. Uh, I worry about what that visual landscape is going to look like, uh, but I also worry a little bit about what it will look like for type designers as well. So can you guys respond to like, what does this mean for type designers? What does it mean for us? Uh, well, or actually not us, obviously I'm not a type designer. What does it mean for type designers to be working in this new paradigm? What, will, what should they do? Like, uh, yeah, do you have any advice for them? Well, it, it's kind of the, the same as always, you know, the if you have sort of like one flavor that gets used everywhere, it only creates the opportunity to like, for people to come in and do responses to that. What's important about the, the Noto project, um, I mean, this is like a major cultural contribution that Google has made possible. Um, anyone can build on top of the Noto fonts. The Noto fonts ensure that a language can be represented digitally. Um, and that puts the, the, basic, the basic options in people's hands that hopefully will inspire them to like, a, you know, make adaptations of that project or design their own typefaces because they can see how it's done. I mean, it was made to be like, a, it's, it's a license without limit. Um, it can be a starting point. So if you don't need the variety, you can still represent your language. If you want to design more, and if you're working in, if, you know, if your native writing system is a complex script, you can see a professionally produced typeface that provides you like a, a map of how to approach that. Yeah, in multiple weights. Sorry, did I turn myself off? <laughs> um, yeah, in multiple weights and in um, 
in serif and sans serif. So it's it's a great starter dough. Yeah. Also, I think benefits of Nodo project is that it's open source, so everyone can contribute to the project. Um, and then type, I think type represents a culture, and the culture always um, keep evolving. Um, so I think Nodo project is a project that everyone can like um, um, contribute to based on like how their culture changes. Even though like we, yeah, we already like puts a lot of effort like from the uh, multiple dimensions of the cultures. So they can contribute to open source projects. Uh, is it still possible to have a small independent type studio? There's, there's more of them than ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a huge world we live in. <laughs> <laughs> it is me. Huge. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a gigantic world with projects of all scales in all corners of that world. So it's... Um, it's fine if you want to be just a Latin one typeface designer to be a Latin one typeface designer, um, but it's a giant world. It's so much fun to be out there in all of it. I mean, type type making is not an industrial activity anymore, like in Monotype's early days. You know, it's you know, it's it's kind of a free for all, which is like filled with potential. Um, and I think you know, each of our companies are also coming at that in a different way of like, we want to make it possible for more people to make fonts and put hands into the fonts of users. You know, my fonts, the Google Fonts Library, the Adobe Fonts Library of Partners, you know, we're, we all want more. There's, we're, we're trying to like encourage a, a, an appetite for more typefaces and encourage more people to make them available. And if, and if you are interested in all these new things like variable fonts and things like, what is, what is your best path? Like through that, do you think? Just be a huge nerd and read a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, do we have time for questions, or should we wrap up and yeah, we're we're all set. Okay, well, thank you guys so much. Thank you for representing. Thank you everybody thank you, for coming. This is like so great to have this community together.